Okay, folks. Before I start, there are a couple of questions I'm going to ask both my corporate finance class and this one just to nag people. How many of you are not part of a group yet? You got the makings of a group right here. So that's one quick solution, right? Look around, see the arms, old fashioned way. Or, you know, but if you're on the orphan list and you've not been adopted, then you might want to reach out to people on that list and see what their interests are. You know, don't wait for a group to adopt you because you might have enough of a critical mass to create your own group. Second question, and I just like an honest answer because right now I'm not expecting the, you know, the, the, the answer I hope to hear soon. How many of you have not picked a company to value yet? Okay. That's, you know, in fact, I, I'm surprised as many of you did not put up your hands. So you're either lying or you're very good at picking a company. But um, I hope that next week when I ask this question, which I will at the start of, you know, next Monday, next Wednesday, by next Wednesday, each of you will have picked a company. Don't play Hamlet here. Don't sit there and say, I can't make up my mind. Should I do this? Should I do that? Just pick a damn company, move on, change your mind if you need to. And if you can go in and enter your company's name in the master list, you're not locked in. You can change your mind. This is just for my you know, well-being. And so I can go to sleep knowing you guys are working on something. So go in and enter a company in that master list. And um, as you go through, you can start filling in the numbers. Okay? So let's... Uh, talk about. The, so today we're going to start on the groundwork of valuation. And um, a few years ago, I wrote a post saying if you have just because you have a D and a CF doesn't mean you have a DCF. The reason I do that is people use this DCF as a cudgel. They're going to say, I did a DCF. And you're supposed to back off saying, oh, you did a DCF. That's great. You must know what you're doing. And today I'm going to argue that there are lots of variants of DCFs that don't pass the smell test. In fact, if I could create a museum of bad DCFs, I would. And a lot of banking DCFs would end up there because of mismatching and inconsistency. So today we're going to talk about being consistent. What I mean by that is you tell me how you estimate the cash flows, and I'll tell you what discount rate goes with the cash flows. So I'm going to lay the groundwork. For you. When you look at a business, you have a choice. You can either value just the equity in the business or value the entire business. It's amazing how people confuse the two. And the simplest way to separate the two is think about buying a house somewhere in the New York area. Unless you're a drug dealer, you have to borrow the money to buy the house, right? So you take a $1.6 million loan, you buy the house, let's say it's worth $2 million. If I ask you the minute after you bought the house, how much the house is worth, your answer is I paid $2 million. I think that's what it's worth. And if I ask you how much your equity in that house is, you're going to say the 400,000, right? 
to six months later, housing prices are down 400,000. I come in and ask you, how much is your house worth? You can say, well, Redfin says I'm worth one, it's worth 1.6 million. If I ask you, how much is your equity worth? It's now worth nothing, right? You can have valuable businesses where equity is worth nothing. Why? Because you borrowed so much money that the business value is less than the outstanding debt. So you have a choice. When you sit down to value a business, you can either value the equity or value the business. And this is something I drum all the way through my corporate finance class. So if you've heard it before, you're going to hear it again. If you're valuing the equity in a business, you've got to wear blinders. When I ask you, what are your cash flows? The cash flow you're going to, you're going to estimate are cash flows to equity investors. What's left over after interest payments, after principal payments, after debt cash flows. And the discount rate you apply on those cash flows will be the rate of return you demand as an equity investor. We, we, let's generically call it cost of equity, but it's what you would demand given the riskiness of the equity investment. Cash flows to equity discount at the cost of equity is the value of equity. You could argue that that is in fact the most intuitive way to think about evaluation is to focus on your share as an equity investor. But there's another way you can approach valuation. Instead of trying to value just the equity in a business, think about the business itself. So remember the house analogy. I'm not asking you what the value of your equity is. I'm asking you what's the value of the house. Remember, there are two people who supplied capital for this business, right? Equity investors who provide equity capital and lenders who provide debt. Could be bondholders, could be banks. When you're trying to value the business, you look at the collective cash flow that both players get out of the business. It's kind of counterintuitive, but I'm saying if you're an equity investor, you get cash flows to equity. Could be dividends, could be cash flows left over. But if you're lenders, you get cash flows as well, right? Interest payment, principal payments. The reason it's counterintuitive, if you're owner of a business, you borrow money, you don't think of the banker as a partner. You often think of him or her as an adversary, but the reality is you're both supplying capital. The collective cash flow you both get out of the business is called the cash flow to the firm. Debt cash flows are no longer cash flows leaving the firm. They go to another claim order of the firm. So that's a cash flow you're now looking at is that collective cash flow. And if that's a cash flow you're discounting, your discount rate can no longer be what you want as an equity investor. It's got to be a weighted average of what you want, which is the cost of equity, and what the lenders want, which is the cost of debt. And if that sounds even remotely familiar, what's that weighted average called? Don't say whack, it's so crude. It's cost of capital, right? So it's a, it's a weighted average of what your equity investors and lenders want. It's a cost of capital. Cash flows the firm, discounted the cost of capital, gives you the value of the entire business. What do you think? But I'm interested in buying shares in the company, you're right. You're interested in the equity. So to get from the value of the business to the equity value, what do I need to do? I need to subtract out, just like I did with the house, what I owe outsiders. I'm going to subtract out the debt. And we'll talk about what you need to and, and, and you don't need to subtract out, but you can back into equity value. So there are two ways you can get to equity value. One is directly by taking cash flows to equity and discounting them at the cost of equity. The other is indirectly by valuing the business and subtracting out debt. First, principle in valuation is don't mix and match. That's going to be the overriding message today, but here's a second message. Sometimes when you look at a valuation and you look at who did it, you allow yourself to be intimidated, right? Goldman Sachs, they must know what they're doing. KKR, they must know what they're doing. So today I want to dispel that mythology that just because somebody's been doing valuation and has a name attached to them, that they're going to follow the first principles of valuation. So I'm going to go back in time and show you a valuation that was done. This is a real acquisition that was done in the late 70s. I almost never do case studies. I've never done a Harvard case study, but sometimes I take pages out of Harvard case studies just for the laugh value. Because let's face it, when something ends up in a Harvard case, it's always strategic. The numbers are an afterthought. You're supposed to tell big fuzzy stories. And as long as the big fuzzy stories sound good, you pass the case. This is from a company called Kennecott. And I'll lay out the backstory. Kennecott was a copper mining company in the 1970s. And it had a coal mining subsidiary called Peabody Coal. And in the late 70s, the antitrust 
rules, the antitrust authorities force Kennecott to divest themselves of the Peabody Coal subsidiary. So they sold the subsidiary, they got $600 million in cash in return. Kennecott is about a $3 billion company. So the minute after they sold Peabody, they had a $600 million cash balance and it terrified the management. See, what were they afraid of? They were afraid that somebody would acquire them and use their own cash to kind of make the acquisition go through. So I have two questions. You're a company, you've got $600 million in cash that you don't have a need for. What's the most sensible way that a publicly traded company can get rid of 600 million that they don't have a use for? Give it back, right? That thought never even crossed Kennecott. What would shareholders do with the money? Stupid things like pay a bill or buy a car. You can't allow that to happen. So let me ask you a second question. You have 600 million in cash. What's the stupidest way to get rid of cash quickly? Go to an investment bank and say, I have a lot of cash. Can you help me spend it, right? I mean, this is, if you think about it, it's silly. It's like walking into is Bloomingdale's pay salespeople on commission. Let's say Bloomingdale's does. You walk in with $5,000 in cash and you wave it and say, I have to spend this by this evening. You're going to have a lot of people surrounding you for the rest of the day, right? But in this case, Kennecott decided that that's what they were going to do. They went to First Boston at that time, one of the leading M&A banks on Wall Street. And they said, look, we have 600 million in cash. Can you help us spend it? And First Boston said, not a problem. We'll find you a perfect target company. And they did. They came back with this company called Carborendum, company that makes abrasives, that coincidentally was available to buy for roughly $600 million. Here's one of the simple rules. You have a lot of cash on your balance sheet. The value of a target company will magically expand to take all the cash out of your balance sheet. But they said, we've done our due diligence, two most dangerous words in business. I don't even know what that means. You know, but you have visions of bank, you know, bankers with eyes. I mean, basically, you think about 15 people working over the numbers. But in this case, they said, we've backed it up with a valuation, and you're going to get a bargain. And these were the cash flows that First Boston used to justify the Carborendum acquisition. I'm going to describe what they did in terms of estimating cash flows. And I want you to think about one very specific question. Given how they estimated cash flows, what is the right discount rate to use? So here's what they did. Started with revenue, subtracted out operating income expenses came up with operating income, subtracted interest expenses to come up with net income, then added appreciation, subtract capex. They went through all the motions and then subtracted our debt payments to come up with their final cash flows. So you ready? So those are the cash flows. You have to come up with a discount rate. I'm going to give you six different discount rates you could use. Only one of them is right. And I want you to tell me which of these six discount rates I should use to discount those cash flows that I just described to you. So you got Kennecott, the acquiring company that's going to come up with the money and I'm, their cost of equity and their cost of capital. You have Carborendum, the target company, the company you're acquiring have their cost of equity and their cost of capital. After the acquisition, there will be a merge company and have a cost of equity and a cost of capital. So let's start with the easy question. Given how they estimated cash flows, should I be using a cost of equity or a cost of capital and why? Anybody want to try? I described the way they got cash flows. So embedded there is the answer. So equity, but why? And what is it about what they did that leads you to the cost of equity? They subtract. The minute you start with net income, you're already kind of digging a hole for yourself as to where you're going. The fact is, these are cash flows after debt payments and cash flows equity. That should be a cost of equity. Now comes the question that half of all MA bankers still get wrong. Whose discount rate? Whose cost of equity? Should I use the acquiring company's cost of equity and play devil's advocate? They're coming up with the money. And we have this notion of cost of equity is what it costs you to raise money. So that's their cost of equity. It's the target company's cost of equity, or maybe some weighted average of the two. What do you think? Target company, does everybody agree with that? 
And what's the reason? Because be ready, because if you go in an M&A group, you're going to be pushed back on that because you're going to say, but it's the acquiring company. What is the rationale for why it should be the target company's cost of equity? But it's still my money, right? I'm coming up with the money. So if I think about cost of equity is what it costs me to raise money as an acquiring company, I'm the one raising the money. Why should I give them the cost of equity of a target company? But I think we're going in circles. So why is using the target company's cost of equity giving me a med better measure of what it's worth? I'm, I can get a present value using my cost of equity as well. Why is that present value? I, you're right, but I want you to, I mean, I want you to come up with the answer because this is something that you will have to fight the fight on, not just on this issue, but lots of discounted cash flow valuations. I'll help you out when you do capital budgeting and you have a project. How do we come up with a discount rate for a project? based on the risk of the project. The discount rate you use should not reflect the risk of the entity raising the money. It should reflect the risk of what you're investing in. Otherwise, every risky business is going to look cheap to you as a safe company, right? I'm going to go around buying, and people do this all the time. AT&T almost destroyed itself in the 1990s because it thought it could take a phone company cost of capital and go around buying all these technology companies. Look, that looks cheap. That looks cheap. No, it doesn't look cheap. You just use the wrong discount rate. Half of all M&A valuations are flawed right off. The if you're in the Delaware courts and you take these fairness opinions, at the minimum, pass it through the consistency test. Because if you've mismatched the discount rate to the cash flows, the rest is almost academic, right? Who cares what your growth rate is? You committed a cardinal sin. Confession is not going to do this for you. Right, this is not one of the I, you know, I coveted my neighbor's Tesla kind of thing. It's like I burnt the neighbor's house down with the neighbor in it, and said, "Can you give me?" It's not something you can just pass by. So the right is, and don't do a weighted average. It doesn't make any sense. It's like you know, you have a three hundred pounder who marries a seventy five pounder. You don't become a Average, uh, if, you know, on average, your weights are okay, right? But one of you is massively underweight, the other is massively overweight. Taking an average doesn't make the problem go away. Doesn't matter. I didn't use the rationale. Use the lowest. There, that's a completely dangerous path to grow, right? Because then, if you're a risky business, you will never buy a safe investment. What if I came to you with a guaranteed investment as Microsoft? But I said, you have a government contract, you're going to make 150 million every year for the next 20 years. I should be using a low. This has nothing to do with being conservative. Don't assume that just because you're being conservative, your DCF is somehow of higher quality. Yeah, the, the entire focus on DCF is to come up with an expected value. So in this case, the discount rate they should have used is 16.5%. You know what first Boston used? What's the worst choice you could make here? Wrong company, wrong discount rate. They use the 10.5%. Can a cost cost of capital? You're saying, what's the big deal? You take their cash flows. You don't change a single assumption. You take their cash flows, use the right discount rate. You knock the present value down by 200 million. This company goes from being undervalued, which was the basis for their fairness opinion to being overvalued. They just got M&A fees for asking a company to pay $150 million more than what they estimated the value of a target company to be. Now, part of the cynical part of you is probably saying they must have known what they were doing, that they wanted to get the deal done. It might be the case. But I really don't think so. I've seen M&A teams value companies. And here's, for any of you working in M&A team, here's what happens. The team splits halfway, midway through the process. Half the team works on estimating cash flows. The other half of the team works on estimating discount rates. And there's always a deadline. Don't ask me why. Midnight on Friday night, 11.55 PM, the two groups come together. You have five minutes left. 
the discount rate. So we have a discount rate. Nobody stops and asks, who's discount rate? Do you cost of equity, cost of capital? You have a discount rate. The other side says, we have the cash flows. This is like a marriage made in heaven. Let's bring them together in a spreadsheet. This is how inconsistencies happen. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Today, we're going to start talking about currencies. You estimate your cash flows in rubles. Your discount rate has to be in rubles. You estimate them in euros. Your discount rate has to be euros. Consistency is something that we're going to come back to over and over again. And this is the start of the process. Now, I have to tell you who the two people who ran first Boston's M&A department in the late 70s were. There were two men, Bruce Wasserstein and Joe Perella. If you remember the terrible things I said about Wasserstein Perella, you can see how these two men were punished for their massive mistakes in valuation, right? They got to start their own boutique investment bank that gave m and advice, God help us. They dished out really bad advice for a decade. Now they got punished for dishing out really bad advice. 10 years later, Dresner, Bank decided to buy Wasserstein Perella for their valuation expertise. I cannot even make up this crap if I tried. But there's no justice in this world. You can do terrible things, but if you get deals done, guess what? You become a hero. Bruce Wasserstein was proud about the fact that he got deals done. And he succeeded at that level. But my point is often in valuations, we look at the cash flows, we look at the discount rate, we don't ask that connecting question. Are the discount rates consistent with the way cash flows are estimated? So file that away because I know some of you will take M&A classes and I've seen M&A classes where professors actually make the mistake of getting the discount rate wrong because this, I think part of the problem is we think of cost of capital as a cost of raising money. And that's one way to think about it. But the cost of capital we use in discounting has nothing to do with that, that definition of cost of capital. It's, a, it's got to do with a risk-adjusted discount rate based on the cash flows you're discounting. It's a very different use. I call the cost of capital the Swiss Army knife of finance. It shows up all over the place in different contexts. And if you're not careful, you can use it in the wrong context. So we'll... Come back, I, I did just one session in M&A because I don't think there's that much that's unique about M&A. But we'll come back and talk about a little bit more about this context and you know what the dangers are. Of... So let's start on the first packet. If you brought your first packet, great. If not, not a big deal. So today we're going to start the digging into intrinsic valuation. I mean, don't make this more glorious and more complex than it has to be. An intrinsic value, you value a business based on its cash flows, based on its risk, based on its growth. You value it as a business, as opposed to what in pricing. You look at what other people are paying for similar things. You know. So if you think about you know, for, for any cash flow generating asset, discounted cash flow valuation is just a way of estimating intrinsic value. Much of the architecture of DCFs has been created in the last century. In fact, the very first book that talks about discounted cash flow valuation is a book by John Williams, 1937. But were people estimating intrinsic value before 1937? I hope so. Intrinsic valuation predates DCF. So you don't need a DCF to do an intrinsic valuation, just a way of thinking, how much do I pay? So one way to think about intrinsic valuation is when, you, if you're a believer in intrinsic valuation, I ask you, how much will you pay for a building that's a rental building? You don't look at the price of the building, what other people are paying. You basically say, what will my rental income be? What will I get afterward? It's, it's a mindset. And with that mindset, the question is, how does it play out? And I'm going to give you the way in which it's usually presented a discounted cash flow valuation. And I'll also give you a variant that's almost never done and you're going to see why, or it's never done right. And you're going to see very quickly why. In traditional discounted cash flow valuation, the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows on the asset. Where you discount those expected cash flows at a risk adjusted discount rate. So in the numerator, what do you have? expected cash flows in, in at least in this utopian world you're looking at every conceivable scenario the expected cash flow should reflect it. 
So there's no afterthought, right? Where after you've done evaluation, you say, oh, by the way, this could happen. It should be in your expected cash flows. So in traditional DCF valuation, the numerator is an expected cash flow with your best unbiased estimates of cash flows and the denominator of a risk-adjusted discount rate. There's a variant on discounted cash flow valuation that you almost never see done right. Where instead of discounting expected cash flows at a risk-adjusted discount rate, you discount what are what are called certainty equivalent cash flows. To understand certainty equivalent cash flows, I'm going to ask you about a TV show that hardly anybody seems to have seen anymore. It's called, it's called um, Let's Make a Deal with Howie Mandel. Have you ever seen this show? If you haven't, I'll describe what, it's not a complicated show. Here's how it goes. So you're a contestant. I'm Howie Mandel. I call you up on the stage. There are two suitcases on the, and there are actually two suitcases actually designed that way. One suitcase has a million dollars. The other suitcase has nothing. And here's how the show goes. Howie Mandel offers money to you to walk away from the deal. Now, if you think, if you're completely risk neutral, how much would he need to offer you to walk away from the deal? What's the expected value? Million dollars one? Yep. 500,000, right? But if you watch the show, people walk away at 350,000, 370. Are they being irrational? Absolutely not. Why are you settling for 400,000? Because you have it in your hand. It's guaranteed as opposed to an expected value. That 400,000 you accept as a certain cash flow in exchange for that expected cash flow of 500 is called a certain equivalent. You see why people don't want to do this in valuation? You want to value Coca-Cola. Here's what you do. You get the expected cash flows the next 10 years. Then Howie Mandel comes in and says, you know what? The expected cash flow in year one is 1.2 billion. What would you expect as a guaranteed cash flow? And depending on how risk averse you are, you might say 800, 900 million. And you replace each of the expected cash flows with a guaranteed equivalent cash flow. If you do that, and it's a big F, you now have cash flows that are in a sense certain equivalent. They're like guaranteed cash flows. What's the discount rate that I should apply on those cash flows then? It should be the risk-free rate. One of the biggest challenges in teaching this class is people who read too much Warren Buffett because he says so many things. It's not his fault. He, and you talk and talk and talk and you've got what, 100 years of annual meetings that I'm overstating, but you know, you know, 50 years of books are and he said things that sometimes come back in this class. And one of the things is that he doesn't like betas and he doesn't like you know, the cap M. And he's actually extrapolated from that. I know somewhere along the way, he said, I don't even adjust my discount rate. So of course you end up in the class and you say, well, Warren Buffett values companies using a risk-free rate as a discount rate. Why are you using a risk-adjusted discount rate? And I tell him, look, go back and look at what he claims he's discounting because he never shows a full, but he does mention that he does, he counts only those earnings that he thinks are countable. He doesn't like speculative earnings. He doesn't like things that might or might not happen. In, in a sense, what's he doing? He's doing a Howie Mandel on the cash flows, right? He's coming up with some way of adjusting the cash flows. It's very fuzzy, it's, but that's basically what he's doing. You're saying, why shouldn't I do that? If you do that, don't double count, right? I've seen analysts say, I'm going to count only the earnings, just like Warren Buffett, but I'm going to use a risk-adjusted discount rate. Make your choice if you decide to go the certain equivalent route that you're going to do it, and then work it through. It's not easy to do. I wouldn't do it. Can you imagine trying to get the certainty equivalent cash flow for a Tesla? I would drive myself crazy. And the information you need to get a certain equivalent is exactly the same information you need to get a discount rate. And I'll take the well-trodden path over the likely trodden path every single time. So what I'd like to do is actually use that present value equation. Now often, you know, I, you know, when I valued Adani two days ago or Tesla a couple of weeks ago, one of the pushbacks I get is I get accused of being a valuation theorist academic. None of these are supposed to be complementary words, theorist, academic, basic. No. And I have to laugh because I know how little theory there is in this class. You know what? You, you want to see the entire theory for this class? It's right there. One equation. The entire class, and I'll give it away, is about coming up with better estimates of expected cash flows and finessing the discount rate to bring in risk. That's it. 
So, but I'm going to use that equation to kind of extract some basic lessons about intrinsic valuation. You guys are sitting a little far away from me, so this game is going to be a little difficult. I have to approach you. So I want somebody to be my guinea pig. You want to be my guinea pig on this? Trust me, you're going to look really good after you play along with me. Yes. So here's what I'm going to do. I want everybody to see what I have. I have a $20 bill. I'm going to put it into the envelope. There's nothing else there, right? Okay. No, my sleeves are all rolled up. I'm not David Copperfield, so no. So you ready for the question? You saw me put $20 in there, right? How much should you pay for this envelope? That's what most people say. First rule in valuation. If you pay $20 for an envelope of $20, what do you walk away with from this transaction? You basically get an envelope, but look at how tattered it is. I kind of written all over. I stole it from upstairs. First rule in valuation. If you know the value of something, start your bidding at a lower number or a higher number. Good. You, none of you are destined to be bankers then because if you said higher, you have a life as a banker. Go for it, right? Because you don't know what disease I have. Maybe I can't read numbers. Maybe I put the 20 and think I have a dollar bill in there. But I'm going to make this interesting. So we, let's say it, it is a simple asset to value, right? So if I open it up for bidding, you know, sooner or later, I'm going to converge on $20. So let's say the envelope is now valued at $20 because there's $20 in. I'm going to add something to this envelope. And I want you to tell me how much you'd pay for the envelope after I add it. What does this say? What's a word on there? Control. I'm going to add control to this envelope. You now have $20 plus control. <laughs> Remember the envelope was worth $20 before? I added control to it. How much should you pay for this envelope now? Your future as a banker just shattered. You know why I did the word control, right? If you ever worked in m and anywhere, What's the rule? You value a target company and add a 20% control premium. Why? In fact, a few years ago, I did this for a group of Goldman Sachs bankers. It's a re-education camp. They're experienced bankers. They brought them back. None of them wanted to be there. I put this envelope up. One of the bankers decides he's going to be clever. He says, I'll be 25. You know what I did? I sold him the envelope. <laughs> He complained. I said, now that it's your own money, you feel the pain, right? Because what did he do? He paid $5 for a three by five card that I stole from upstairs and wrote the word. You know how much it cost me to write that? Absolutely nothing. It's just a word. You can see where this is going, but let's keep going. What does this say? Synergy. Let's put that in there. How much is it worth? It's a three by five card with the word synergy. I can go crazy with this. What does it say? If you're a marketing person, you're doing somersault. This is amazing. Brand name. I'll put that in there. I could write ESG and put that in there. Sustainability and put it in there. I call these weapons of mass distraction. Let me repeat that again. Mass distraction. You know why I call them weapons of mass distraction? Because these words show up right after you value the company. And people want to pay more. Where's the control? What about synergy? How about ESG? But I'll give you two magic words. One that continues to work. As long as business has been around, this word's been the way in which you get the extra premium. The other used to work well, but to show you how weapons of mass distraction can turn against you, it's gone from being a source of a premium to perhaps a source of a discount. So here's the first of those words. You want to read this to the class? What does it say? Strategic. That word is the most dangerous word in business. You know what it really means, right? The numbers don't fly, but I really, really want to do this. What's a strategic deal? A really stupid deal you should not be doing, but you want to do anyway. You're trying to sell your business? Find a strategic buyer. You know what strategic buyers do? They make up their mind they want to buy your company before they show up at the bargaining table. Whenever I hear the word strategic, my antenna start, starts quivering. You know, What exactly are you trying to bypass here? The other word that used to add zeros to your valuation. 
It was a word that doesn't work as well anymore. Can you read this to the class? What does it say? China. Until about three years ago, you were valuing a business. It was worth 10 billion. The buyer's acting all, I can't pay more than 10 billion. I'm a canny buyer. All you have to say, but we're in China. Magically, zeros start to pop up in your valuation. It's amazing what a billion people seems to do to common sense. Three years ago, China was a source of extra zeros. The problem with the weapons of mass distraction is what works at one time might not work at another. So I'm going to state a proposition that stood me in good stead whenever I run into these issues. I call it the it proposition. Sounds fancy, but here's what the it proposition says. If it does not affect the cash flows and it does not affect risk, it cannot affect value. You're saying, what's it? You name it. Let's go back and review the words that I put into that envelope. Control. Forget about what bankers do in the 20% premium. What is the true value of control? What do you get to do when you have control? Anybody want to give that a try? What is exactly? Yeah. More than I say, you can change the way a business is run, right? So to value control, here's what I need to do. I need to value the company twice. Once with the existing management in place with what they do, and once with you in place with all the things you claim you can do. And assuming your plans have some basis, the difference in values should be the value of control. So if Nelson Peltz said, value control at Disney, I'm going to value Disney run by Bob Iger and value Disney again with Nelson Peltz, but he better be specific about what he plans to do with the company. And that difference should be the value of control. You know how powerful that concept is? Because here are the implications. If you have a company that's already perfectly managed and perfectly run, What's the value of control? Zero. If you have a company that's abysmally managed and abysmally run, it could be 100%. Who makes up these rules of thumb of 20% and says that's the value of control? What's the value of synergy? And don't give me the two plus two is equal to five crap that you hear in class. That the two plus two is not five, it's four. But the value of synergy is two businesses come together and they're able to do things they could not have done as standalone companies. Can I value synergy? Yes. But you got to describe what the synergy is. Is it higher growth? Is it lower cost? And my job is to convert that into earnings and cash flows and risk and say, this is the value of synergy. Not use it as a plug variable to explain away the difference between what you pay and what's something you value at. It's value of a brand name. You hear the marketing class all the time. Everything has a brand name. You ask me, every company claims to have a brand name. You know the power of a brand name is? You get to charge a higher price for exactly the same product. I know it sounds simplistic, but if you want to see brand name at play, walk into the Dwayne Reed at the end of the street. Walk into the painkiller aisle, check out the bare aspirin that's still there on the shelves. And right next to it is a generic version of aspirin, exactly the same drug, but the bare aspirin sells for more. And think of how many people buy the bare aspirin. They're not being crazy. That is the power of a brand name. A little later in this class, we're going to use that inside and saying, if you have a brand name, it's got to show up as pricing power. And if there's pricing power, you have to have higher margins. If higher margins, I can value a brand name. Three years ago, when I first, I, you know, the way I describe my ESG journey is I started because I was curious. And after I discovered there was nothing there, I was cynical. And I'm reaching the point of contempt at this point, whenever I hear the ESG talk come up, because there's nothing there. If a concept could be toxic and empty at the same time, ESG has pulled it off. But I'll tell you what led me to that place. I heard all this talk from, you know, you've heard Larry Fink say, being good increases value. I said, really? Okay, where is it? Is it in higher growth? Is it in higher margins? Is it in lower risk? So that's the way I looked at the research. I said, show me because I'm, I'm willing to listen maybe. And being good increase the value of some companies? Absolutely. Patagonia probably benefits from its ESG label because what does it do? sell overpriced outerwear to guilty yuppies, right? 
I mean, that's a reality. You sell four hundred dollars, and you are to convince the world you're saving the world by spending four hundred dollars in this pack. I mean, you might love your Patagonia, but don't tell me you've saved the world because you put on a Patagonia jacket. So, could Patagonia be using ESG as a way? Yeah. But for Nike, with a thirty-three billion dollar revenue instead of a billion dollar revenue, there are costs and trade-offs, right? If you decide you're not going to sell in a country, it better not be China because that's cut off 30% of your market right there. That's why when the, when the Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, a lot of ESG people were beating that just look, you know, this is why you should, you know, we'll teach the Russians a lesson. We'll, you know, we can debate that. But the question I asked was if China had invaded Taiwan, would you be as willing to say, I'm going to abandon China? Because the, you know, there are trade-offs. So if you're going to talk about value, show me. Show me the substance. Even words like strategic, we need to push back. What's strategic about it? Where are the benefits going to show up? So that's the eighth proposition. The second proposition is a don't be a wuss proposition. Basically, you know, people who, you know, I've, I've seen people give up on valuation. Why? Because there's too much uncertainty. Remember statistics, when you have too much uncertainty, it doesn't mean you cannot make estimates. It means your estimates come with more noise. If you let uncertainty be a reason for not, not valuing companies, I'll tell you exactly where you'll end up. You'll be valuing Kraft, Heinz, and Coca-Cola over and over again for the rest of your life because you feel certain. This is one reason when Warren Buffett said, I don't invest in anything I don't understand. I said, be very careful because the older you get, the less of the world you're going to understand. It's the nature of getting old, right? What the heck are these kids doing? They're watching TikTok videos. Bite dance must be worth nothing. It, that's absurd. Sometimes you got to accept the fact that you don't know as much, but you still have to make your best estimates. So let's say you take my advice. You pick a company with a lot of uncertainty. You sit down to value it. And you notice you have cash flows in your one that are negative. Why? Because it's still growing cash flows and you're two are negative cash flow. And your cash flows turn out to be negative all the way through because they have a business model that's unfixable. You see, why would you start a company if that's the case? People do stupid things and other people supply these stupid people with the capital to keep making the stupid things bigger. Remember Movie Pass? Probably the dumbest business idea I've ever seen show up. Those of you who don't remember Movie Pass, it was a business that was started but for $9.99 a month. You could watch as many movies and movie theaters as you wanted. $9.99. Many of you guys gone to a movie in New York City. What does it cost you to go in once? Like $20 now? But even if you were in Des Moines, Iowa, it'll cost you, what, $7.50? But pay $9.99, you can go to 20 movies and Movie Pass would reimburse the theaters for as many movies. And I remember thinking about it, how the heck do these guys make money? And the answer is they did not. So I actually watched the CEO of Movie Pass on, uh, on TV. It was on CNBC and he's trying to explain why. He said the average American goes to one movie a month. We're charging 99. The average theater in the US charges only $6. You know, you can drown in a lake that has an average depth of only six inches. Averages can be extremely deceptive. But you know how stupid this argument is? Because it's not the average American who's buying movie pass, there's a selection bias. There's a self selection, right? You know who buys movie pass? People like my older son who love the movies. They go to 20 movies a month. You're on a pathway to bankruptcy. The only question is when and how, you know, and how deep is the hole going to be? But think of how many billions of capital went into movie pass because before people came to this recognition. So let's say you picked a movie pass like company. You have negative cash flows for the next 10 years and forever. And then you come and ask me, how much should I pay for this company? I'm going to slap you around the face and say, wake up. You don't need a valuation class to know that somebody offers you an endless stream of negative cash flows. They should be paying you, not the other way around. Be amazed at how many emails I get. I'm valuing money, losing company. I expect to lose money forever. How much should I pay for the company? Come on, guys. No discounted cash flow model is needed here. So I'm going to call that the DER proposition. 
If you have negative cash flows as far as the eye can see, just let it go. And if somebody insists you take it, they should be paying you. Which brings me to my final proposition. And this is a much more nuanced proposition. So, yeah. Is it good or bad? What does it depend on? No, no, forget about the core business. The core business is going to be profitable whether they do this or not. So this is all about, and that's actually a good question because whenever you focus on a company, focus on what moves, what doesn't. So the core business is profitable, whether they do this or not, that's not changing. So what are they doing that, that raises issues? They're investing in a new business, right? Is that going to be value adding, value destructive or value neutral? You know, what's going to determine that? Forget about the earnings. It's how much you put into those businesses, what you're going to get in return, you know, earnings, cash flows, forever. I mean, think of it like a project, right? When you take a positive net present value project, what happens to your value? It goes up. So if you go into new businesses and you earn roughly your cost of capital, guess what? You get bigger, but your value is not going to change. If you go into new business, you earn more than your cost of capital, then your value is going to go up. And you go into new businesses and earn less than your cost of capital. I don't care how big you're getting, you're actually destroying value. So that's going to be the driver for all growth, right? It's not just whether you have a cash generating business or not, but that's going to be the question you ask about every single investment that a company makes. But now talk about nuance. Let's say that you've picked a company and you estimate cash flows next year, they're negative. Year two, still negative. Year three, negative, but it's getting less negative. And as you go through time, the cash flows get less negative, flip into positive cash flows and become really, could a company like that be worth a lot? I hope so. Because what is the type of company that's going to have this, this type, these types of cash flows? Well, you know, if you think about company, biotech, I heard, but what do they share in common? They're young companies, could be infrastructure companies, could be biotech companies, could be you know, social media companies. It's not the sector that makes it happen. It's the fact that they're young companies that are putting in the money now and hoping for a payoff in the future. We're gonna value a few young companies here. I'm gonna value Amazon in 2000, maybe Peloton three years ago and now. And you, you know what you're going to see in common with these young companies? Negative cash flows in the first four, five, six years. That's a feature. It's called cash burn. And people ring their hands, oh my God, there's cash burn. But cash burn is a feature of these companies. It's not a bug. It's what you have to live through to get to the promised land. And it's not going to be easy, right? Because you're burning through cash flows. Will I survive? Will I survive? So we're going to factor those issues in. But this notion that discounted cash flow valuation is designed for nice, mature companies misses the point. The, the process itself is incredibly flexible. It's our discomfort that makes it rigid. If you insist that your cash flows have to be positive, if you insist that there's got to be more certainty in estimates, you are restricting yourself. But it's not the problem with the model. It's a problem with you and the way you're applying the model. So let's very quickly revisit what I started the class with. I said, if you have cash flows to equity, cash flows after debt payments, use the cost of equity, value the equity. If you have cash flows, the entire business, pre-debt cash flows, use a cost of capital discounted, you got to value the firm. And then if you subtract out debt, you should come up with value of equity. We're going to come back and examine what we should be subtracting out to get to value of equity. But let me give you a very quick preview. You've taken cash flows of the firm, pre-debt cash flows. You've discounted them at the cost of capital. You come up with the value of the business. You want to see how much your equity is worth. I'm going to give you a few choices and what you can subtract out. And you tell me which of those choices is the right one. So you've got cash flows of the firm, discounted the cost of capital. You come up with the value of the business. Should you be subtracting out only long-term debt? Should you be subtracting out total debt? Should be subtracting out all liabilities. And on a balance sheet, you can see very different numbers, right? Total debt, long-term debt, total debt, all liabilities will include accounts payable, supply of credit. Or maybe whatever you call debt when you did your cost of capital. Because remember earlier, to get a discount rate, a cost of capital, you had to use weights for debt and equity. I'm not going to give you the answer right now, but I want you to start because I've seen discounted cash flow valuations that subtract all of these. Right? And you get very different answers for your equity.
But I'm going to give you a small snapshot of how to think about debt. And when we got to talk about leases, we'll talk about why this is relevant. I've treated leases as debt for 30 years. Accountants came to that recognition or realization about three years ago, 2019. So when I value firms, I treat leases as debt when I do cost to capital. And it's got mixed effects, right? You treat leases as debt, your cost to capital will often go down because you're using more debt, which is a good thing, right? From a DCF, I get a bigger value for the business, but then I subtract our debt. I include leases as debt because if I counted it as debt when I did my cost of capital, I have to count it as debt when I subtract it out. It's a consistency issue, right? Again, consistency plays out. You can't change your mind on what to call debt when you go from cost to capital subtraction. There are things like underfunded pension obligations that we have to come back and deal with. What do we do with those? What if your company is a target of a lawsuit? Because as an equity investor, all of those are concerns that hang over your head, right? And we come back and delve into those. But let's say you do it right. You take the value of the business, you subtract out the right amount of debt, you come up with the value of equity. Remember, you could have taken the equity and valued it directly as well, right? Taking cash flows to equity and discount the cost of equity. I'm going to ask you two questions. You, you, you're welcome to give me two different answers. Would you like to get the same value for your equity using both approaches? You're an investor, right? You just decide by... Imagine if the two approaches gave you different answers. What the heck are you going to do with it? Buy with an equity approach? I don't think when you go on Schwab online, it says buy, did you use an equity approach? We'll credit you with that. You buy or you sell, right? So at least in theory, you'd like the numbers to be the same, no matter which approach you use. To me, it's one of the toughest challenges in discounted cash flow valuation to see if those numbers converge. And if they don't converge, what the reason for the non-convergence is. I told you about weekly challenges. Your first weekly challenge is going to come this week. It's going to probe that. But I'm going to give you a setup example so you can see how this process works. And to do this, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a company. I'm going to show you my estimated cash flows. We know we haven't gone into the details of how to, but let's say I've done the dirty work. I give you cash flows to equity, cash flows left over after debt payments, and cash flows to the firm. I also give you a cost of equity for this company, 13.625%. And I tell you that this firm, when it borrows money, has to pay 10% pre-tax. Now, if you've done corporate finance, you know why there's a distinction between pre-tax cost of debt and after-tax cost of debt. In much of the world, interest is tax deductible. And if you borrow money at 10% with the tax benefits of debt, you got to factor in that tax benefit. In this case, with a 50% tax rate, and you borrow money at 10%, you're effectively borrowing money at 5% after taxes. So you got a 13.625% cost of equity, a 5% after tax cost of debt. This is going somewhere. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to take this company and first value its equity directly. What does that mean? I take cash flows to equity and discount them at the cost of equity. Let's try that. Cash flows to equity, discount at the cost of equity gives me a value of 1,073 million for the equity. So I'm being consistent, I'm doing the right discount rate, I'm not pulling a first Boston here. Now, of course, I could value the entire business, right? To value the business, what do I need? I need a cost of capital. To get a cost of capital, I take the cost of equity and the after-tax cost of debt, and I need weights for debt and equity. And the weights we tend to use in valuation tend to be market value weights. There's a circularity, I will come back and talk about that later in the class. But let's say the market value of equity is 1,073 million. I've concocted this example to give me the answer I want. And I want you to think about what it is about this example that's going to lead me to where I want to go. But my cost of capital on a weighted average basis is 9.94%. I discount my cash flow to the firm at that 9.94% cost of capital. The value that I get as a present value is 1,873 million. But remember, that's the value of the firm. I subtract out the 800 million in debt. Magically, I get exactly the same value for equity. I've delivered your utopian message, right? Get the same value. But I had to play some assumption games to get there. And this week's challenge is going to pose that issue of what it is that I'm assuming in this example that led me to the same answer. 
And it's not difficult. You start digging, say, what am I assuming? But the reason I want you to do that is people do this without even thinking about it. They make implicit assumptions. And I want you to make those assumptions explicit. Because could I have screwed up on this? Absolutely. I could have taken cash flows and mismatched them. And as I said, that's a first principle. If you take cash flows to equity, you've got to use the cost of equity. If you take cash flows of firm, you've got to use the cost of capital. And in this case, if I'd mismatch, I'm going to get horrendous mistakes, right? I take cash flows to equity and discount them at the cost of capital. I did what I what, what first Boston with Kennecott. I'm going to overvalue the company by 175 million. Not because I got the cash flows wrong or the discount rate wrong. They're both right, but they don't match each other. If I took cash flows to the firm and discount the cost of equity, I understate the value of the entire business, right? Because I've used too high a discount rate in those cash flows. But the problem is you have no idea what you're valuing, right? If you've used cash flows to the firm and you used to, you, know, you, you don't even know whether you're valuing fir firm or equity. I've seen people actually take cash flows to the firm, discount the cost of equity, gets so completely lost that they forget to subtract out the debt, in which case you massively overvalue equity. And if you subtract out the debt, you're going to undervalue equity. There are lots of different pathways to hell here if you mismatch cash flows and discount rates. Taking that pause up front saying, am I matching right, is well worth the trouble. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to lay the baby steps for doing intrinsic valuation, lay out the picture, and start at least talking about the estimation process that's coming. So every discounted cash flow model, what, what, no matter what matches you do, you got cash flows, you got a discount rate, you take a present value. So in a generic discounted cash flow model, you've expected cash flows, you got a risk adjusted discount rate, you get a present value. But there's one mechanical detail that I still haven't tied up. If you remember the equation for the value of an asset, I said it's the present value, the expected cash flows over the life of the asset, right? So if you have a 10 year asset, you could produce, you estimate cash flows for 10 years, 15 year asset. And here we run into a little bit of a estimation problem with publicly traded companies, at least in theory. How long can a publicly traded company last? Forever, right? You open up a corporate chart, it tells you when it was founded. It doesn't tell you, you say empirically that's not true. Companies wind up, you're right, companies, but at least in theory, your company could keep going and going and going and going. So to value a company, what do I need to do? I need to estimate expected cash flows forever. This is my vision of hell, an Excel spreadsheet that never ends, right? That's basically what forever looks like. So it's natural for people to say, can I stop now? How about right now? But you can't just stop and forget what happens after that point in time. You've got to put closure. So I'm going to tell you when you can stop and what assumptions you have to make, and you're not going to like the assumption. You can stop estimating cash flows if you're willing to make an assumption. And the assumption has to be that beyond that point in time, your cash flows grow at a constant rate forever. Scary word, forever. You know what that buys you? It buys you an infinite series in mathematics. And 200 years ago, mathematicians solved for the value of that series. In finance, we stole that equation from mathematics. We act like we invented this. But this is that famous terminal value equation you see in every discounted cash flow valuation. And I'm not talking about the banker's version, which is a completely screwed up version where you lose eight times EBITDA. The version that you see in a DCF where you have the cash flows in year 11 divided by R minus C, one of the most dangerous equations in valuation because you can misuse it. That's what you do, put in closure. But to do that, what do you have to assume? The cash flows grow at a constant rate forever. Now I'm gonna say something that I get an amazing amount of pushback on. And I'm surprised because this isn't a finance or an economics point, it's a mathematical point, which is, when you talk about a growth rate forever, that growth rate comes with a cap. You know what the cap is? It cannot be greater than the growth rate of the economy in which you're in. You see why this is a math issue, not a finance issue, right? You have two numbers. One is a low number, one's a high number. You let the low number grow at 7% a year, the high number grow at 4% a year, and you let them both keep growing. What's going to happen eventually? 
the low number is going to hit and it won't stop, right? The low number will keep going. Every company at some point in time will hit what I call a scaling wall. We're going to talk about when that will be for a company. It's one of the big issues with Tesla, right? Will they hit the wall at 400 billion or a trillion? It's going to make a big difference in evaluation. Groupon hit it at 20 billion. Walmart hit it at like 450 billion. But every company eventually hits a wall. And it's a good thing because from a valuation perspective, that's when you put closure. So if you think about the structure of a model, there are the cash flows for a period, five years, 10 years. There's a terminal value that kicks in only when you tell me your company is a mature company. My definition of a mature company is a company that grows at a rate less than or equal to the growth rate of the economy. It can be less than, but it can't be greater than. And a risk adjusted discount rate. Now, of course, you can get variance on discounted cash flow models. And I lay out the, the most common variants, the three most common variants. I told you about the 1937 discounted cash flow valuation paper. It was about valuing equity. It was focused on cash flow as equity, but it had a very strict definition of what a cash flow equity was. You buy shares in a publicly traded company. What's the only cash flow that's tangible that you can actually point to? That's my cash flow equity. Dividends, right? Everything else is kind of illusion. I can do all the free cash flows I want, but the dividend discount model is a special case of an equity valuation model. You take dividends, you discount them at the cost of equity, come up with the value of equity. But when you do that, what are you assuming? That companies pay out what they can afford to in dividends. Do they? There's some might, but we know beyond any reasonable questioning that most companies don't pay out what they can afford to in dividends. And here's how we know. There's a cash balance in your company, right? You have an $80 billion cash balance. Don't even tell me with a straight face that you've been paying out what you can afford to because this is not manna from heaven that showed up in your balance sheet. It's a direct consequence of holding back. So I'm going to give you an alternative to dividends. A company like Google, you know, can pay dividends, chooses not to. In fact, many tech companies have decided not to pay dividends at all. They'll use buybacks over time to return cash. Let's estimate potential dividends. Sounds complex, right? But what's potential dividend? It's whatever cash flow is left over after meeting all your debt needs and capex and working capital. And can we estimate that for a company? That's what's in the statement of cash flows, right? You give me a statement of cash flows, I can tell you potential dividend in like three or four minutes. This isn't rocket science. So the second approach to valuation is replace actual dividends with potential dividends, free cash flow equity. It's still an equity valuation. So your discount rate is still going to be a cost of equity. And what you get as a present value will be the value of equity in a company. Could that value be different from your dividend discount model? Absolutely. If you take a company like Google, you might get a very low value from the dividend discount model because they choose not to pay dividends. Your free cash flow equity model will fix it. And the third way you can estimate cash flows is as pre-debt cash flows, free cash flow to the firm. You did discount them at the cost of capital. What do you get as a present value will be, but in every, every DCF model, whether it's dividends or free, you're doing the same thing, right? You're estimating cash flows during a finite period. You're assuming constant growth beyond that. And you're using a discount rate that reflects what you're... So I can actually take these models and show them as pictures. And for the moment, take them as pictures because we haven't talked about the details. You ask me to value a company based on a dividend discount model, I get focused on dividends. I look at what they've paid as a percentage of earnings as dividends in the past, it's called a payout ratio. And my entire forecasting is built around what will earnings be in the future, what will the payout ratio be in the future. I get expected dividends, I discount them back at the cost of equity. And people feel more comfortable with the dividend discount model. You know why? Because you're taking the dividend as a fact. You're not questioning it. You're saying that's $3 in dividends. I don't have to estimate cash flows. I've taken a load off your shoulders, but you have to recognize there's a consequence for doing that. You're trusting companies to pay out what they can. So in a dividend discount model, you get expected dividends. You discount the cost of equity, come up with the value of equity in the company. You're done. No cleaning up to do. When you do free cash flow equity, we estimate potential dividend. You can, be a you can bring in a little more finesse to the game. In what sense? Remember when a company has you know, a business it's in and has a cash balance, 
both generate income, right? The cash balance generates interest income, the business generates net income and all. You know. So if you're doing free cash or equity valuation, you can say, look, I'm going to keep the cash separate. Why am I going to, you know, why do I want to mess up my valuation with something that's easy to value? You take your non-cash net income, the net income you're getting from your non-cash assets, you come up with a free cash or equity, you discount them at the cost of equity, you come up with the value of the equity in the non-cash assets, and then you can add cash on and say, look, I'm done. Little trickier than a dividend discount model because now you're making estimates. And finally, if you look at a you know, free cash flow, the firm model, you're now looking at pre-debt cash flows. Everything is focused on pre on, on growth in those cash flows. Your terminal value is based on growth in that cash flow. Your discount rate is a cost of capital. I know we're right, you know, these pictures just blur, you know, blur together, but I want you to put the pictures next to each other so you can see that every discounted cash flow model is built around the same structure. Finite period of cash flows, a cash flows growing at a constant rate forever after that, a discount rate that reflects the cash flows and a present value with cleaning up. Especially when you value a firm, there's a lot of cleaning up to do, right? If you value the business based on operating income, you have cross holdings, you have cash. You got to bring that into the game because you can't just leave them to the side. So we'll spend an entire session on tying up loose ends when you do firm valuation because there are a lot of loose ends to go. So let's spend some time in process. Last Friday, if you'd asked me what I know about the Adani Group, I'd have said, I've heard about them. I've heard rumors about them. I've never looked at the company. I don't have any idea. And that would have been the truth. So Saturday morning when I sat down, I said, look, I have to value the company. And value the company with nothing. So guess what the first thing I did was? I downloaded the historic easier now than it was 20 years ago because downloading the historical data meant going into S&P Capital IQ. It's a nag of if you haven't signed up yet, you know, get that access to Capital IQ. It's an amazing data resource. And I downloaded the data for the entire life of the company from 2002 through 2022. So it downloads all of the income statements, all of the, it's, it's overkill, right? You're, you're saying, what do I do with this? When you look at past data, and this is not just true for the Adani Group, but for the, your company you pick, you're looking at the past data, not because you're interested in the past, but because you might get clues about the future, right? That's why we look at the past. And what are the questions you're trying to get answers for? You're trying to get answers of how quickly has my company grown? And with the Adani Group, it was, immense. The revenues had jumped tenfold over the last 10 years as they went from infrastructure business to infrastructure business. So I'm learning something about growth. And I'm focusing on revenue growth because revenue growth captures the growth of operations better than income growth. I also wanted to see how profitable they are. So I computed things like profit margins. Again, I never compute a ratio unless it's helping me answer a question. And for those of you who read my Adani post, they're not a profitable company. Their margins are 3.6%. And it's not because they're a young growth company. It's because they're in an infrastructure business. You're on ports, you're on airports, you have transmission lines. These are not 50% margin businesses. These are five, six, 7% margin businesses. So they have fast growth, but their profitability is lag. Now, the final question is, how the heck did they increase their revenues tenfold? An infrastructure business, what do you have to do? You got to invest money. So again, I'm looking at the past to see how much did they invest to get into these businesses and where did they get the money? It's in the, in the financial statements, right? It tells you. And with the Adani Group, they had huge amounts of reinvestment and almost 95% of it came from debt. Okay, none of these are meant as a good or a bad thing. I'm learning about the company. Why? Because my job is to forecast the future. I'm going to use the past as the basis for this, but I'm also going to look at now, what does the rest of the sector look like? If you're a company making 3.6 margins in a sector where everybody else makes 30% margins, I'm going to stop and ask, well, is there hope here? Could you go to 30% margins? Is the economies of scale that are going to kick in? So you look at your company, you look at the industry, and then after you're done, you got to leave your safe spot. Because right up till then, it's all about looking at the past. You can always blame the accountants. But if you're forecasting the future, guess what? You have to make your best estimate. So what did I estimate? I assumed that they would continue their path of strong revenue growth. Why? Because they focused on it. They want to grow. And their political connections might help them on this. So the growth is there. 
I don't think the margins have much room to run. I did allow margins to improve over time because infrastructure investments take a while to mature and your margins tend to improve, but they're not going to improve to 30, 40, 50%. I stopped at seven, which is higher than the industry average, the global industry average for infrastructure companies, about five to 6%. I'm letting them have higher margins. Again, perhaps the political connection competitive advantage is coming into play, but I have only so much room to run. And will they need to reinvest to get this growth? Absolutely. So I had to build in a reinvestment that reflect that. So when you're forecasting the future, you're taking what you learned from the past and you're trying to make your best estimates for the future. And trust me, you're going to be uncomfortable. You should be, right? Because you're trying to play God. Saying, how do you know you're right? I'll save you the trouble. You're definitely wrong. But so is everybody else trying to value the company. You're making your best judgments. I'll take you to two pathways you can use when you forecast cash flows. In one, you start with operating income, or as McKinsey likes to call it, no plat, but there are lots of different names, but start with operating income and you work down. You know when you can do that? Is when you have a company with stable margins. When you have a company with stable margins, the reason you can start with operating income is growing at the same rate as revenue. So why bother starting with the top line if your margins are always nine or 10%? There are very few companies in the world with stable margins. So if you're valuing a Coca-Cola or a Kraft Heinz, you can get away with this. But if your margins are changing, either up or down, you have no choice but to start with revenues, right? You forecast a growth in revenues. You have to bring in what you know about the company, the market, the competition. You have to forecast margins. Again, bring in what you know about the company, the margins, the competition. And then you got to forecast how much you need to reinvest to get that revenue. So, and I'll give you metrics you can use to make that judgment, but I want you to think big picture. You're starting with the top, not because you have to, but because in this case, when margins are changing, you have no choice but to. And in doing all of this, you still have to answer that unanswered question is when will this company hit a brick wall? When will its growth start to scale down? Not whether, it's when. And in some businesses, it'll be sooner rather than later. So if your company is a um, Slovenian company and it says, look, we're going to stay in Slovenia, you're going to hit a wall sooner rather than later because the market is small. That's the advantage that a Chinese or an Indian company has right off the start, right? Because the wall is further away. You have a billion people, the wall is further away. When you value a Zomato, you have more potential than when you value a European food delivery company because you've got a billion people ordering food. They're not doing it right now, mostly because many of them can't afford to do it. Your potential market gets much bigger. But I want you to remember the reason we look at the past is not because we like to compute ratios of the past, because you could do that, right? You've seen people do financial analysis, but their version of financial analysis, take that past data and, and basically bludgeon it by basically estimating pretty much every ratio known to man. But your job is not to just look at the past, you use the past to make forecasts for the future. Now you will need discount rates, so we go through the process of attaching cost to equity and cost of debt. But think again in broad terms, the cost of debt is the rate at which I can borrow money long-term today. What will it depend on? It'll depend on the rate of level of interest rates outside. The cost of debt for every company in the US has gone up by about two and a half to three percent in the last year, even if nothing has changed. Why? Because the T-bond rate, the base has gone up. So you have to come up with risk-free rates. But you also have to come up with default spreads, which might increase or decrease depending on how risky a company is. Your discount rates have to reflect the world you're in now, not some version of the world you'd like to be in. So you can't normalize things and make your company look, you know, put yourself in a macro environment that you feel more comfortable in, because this is the environment you're in. But when we do valuation, it's all about the future. And that's basically what I want to get started on, is making those judgments for the future. So let's start with some very basic consistency points. Yes. So first, when a company is making a transition, what's the first thing that happens with historical data? 
you got to trust it less, right? Because it reflects the company as it used to be. So Twitter is going to go from being an ad-based company to a subscription-based company. I'm not saying that's the transition they're going to make. You can get, have 50 years of history of their ad-based businesses, but to make your forecast, you're going to be looking at subscription-based business. And remember, we talked about industry averages. So when companies make transitions, historical data will get weighted less in your forecast. And the businesses they're going to go in are going to play a much bigger role in estimating growth and margins and everything else. So how much you can trust the past. So uh, there's this, this mythology that if you're valuing a company with a long history, it gets easy to value. It's true a lot of the time. For a company with a long history that's making a transition, guess what? That history is kind of useless. This is going to be a new company, a different company. So I think that when you have a company with a history that, reflects a very different business model. I mean, take Peloton. For the early part of its existence it was a fitness equipment company that sold these expensive subscriptions to people, but the equipment drove the subscription model. During COVID, of course, they offered a subscription model to people who didn't own Pelotons and that became the fastest growing part of the business. Let's say looking forward, you think the subscription portion of the business is going to expand and the equipment part is going to shrink and go away. You don't want to weight historical data too much because it reflects a different business model. So I think that when you have transitions, it just means that you have fewer crutches. You can't use past data and extrapolate. And that's good to know, right? Because you don't want to be projecting out things based on past data if it's a very different business model. Yes. What was it that uh, Donald Rumsfeld I mean, he said some really strange things. Sometimes you'd have to play it out in your hands. Of what the heck does that mean? I mean, this was during the Iraq war and somebody ta talked about you know, some you know, uncertainties in the future. He said he can't explain the unexplainable. It's like, like listening to Nassim Taleb when he said one drink too many. So what exactly did he say? No, but basically you can bring into expectations only what's in, on your radar. So in 2019, if you ask me, why didn't I bring COVID into my heart? It is because it wasn't even on my radar. Today, when I value a hotel company, if I don't bring in the expectation, something like a pandemic could shut me down, then I'm being imprudent. So I think you can only estimate what you can. And when there's something you cannot estimate, it can cut in both directions. You just basically have to say, look, it's, that's risk out of my hands. I'm going to charge a higher discount rate up front for that risk. So don't play the role of I'm going to forecast the unforecastable, try to bring in things that nobody's ever thought about. And that's why I'm not sure what I do with a black swan. Because when do we know there's been a black swan? Often after the fact, right? So we can talk about tail risks and how to bring them into valuation, but you're not going to see it in your expected cash flows because if you could, then it's not a black swan. So let's start with re-emphasizing the consistency point. You give me cash flows to equity, you got to use the cost of equity, cash flows to firm, you got to use the cost of capital. Starting this session, going to Wednesday session, I'm going to make a big deal about currency and being currency consistent. And you're going to see this play out. You estimate your cash flows in dollars, your discount rate has to be in dollars. And in the process, I'm also going to talk about the possibility that you could value a company in real terms. What does that mean? You basically estimate cash flows without inflation in them, and you estimate a discount rate that doesn't have inflation in it. It's called a real valuation. So let's step back. In all of this, what are we trying to do? We have expected cash flows in the numerator, and we risk adjusted discount rate of the denominator. At the risk of oversimplifying things, think of the ingredients that go into your discount rate. It starts with the risk free rate, right? It's almost impossible to do discounted cash flow valuation if you can't identify what you can make on a guaranteed investment. That's your risk free rate. That's going to depend on what currency you're doing evaluation in. You're valuing a company in Turkish lira, your risk free rate is going to be very different than if you valued in euros. We'll talk about why risk free rates vary across currencies, but that's your starting point. Second, you need to be aware and bring in the price of risk in the market. You know what I mean by that? You're investing in equities. That's a price that equity investors are charging for investing in equities. We call it an equity risk premium. We can talk about estimation challenges you face in coming up with that risk premium, but that's the price of risk in the market. Nothing to risk free rate, equity risk premium have nothing to do with your company. But then I ask you, is your company riskier than average or safe? I'm asking a question about relative risk, and that's going to depend on your business model, right? If you sell discretionary stuff, you're riskier than if you sell non-discretionary stuff. 
And we try to capture that as a relative risk measure. If you get too many finance classes, what do you replace as relative risk measure with that? You know, it almost becomes a beta. It's just a relative risk measure. That's how I think about betas. I don't give them some glory and put some model in back. It's just a relative, a beta 1.5 means you're 1.5 times more risky than the typical company in the market. So before we delve into estimating those, I want to set the table for thinking about risk. Now, once you've picked your company, here's an exercise to go through. List out every conceivable thing that you're uncertain about. And I'll tell you upfront, it's going to be a very long list, right? In fact, if you try to list the things you're certain about, I don't think there's even a single item on that list. What do you feel certain about? You know the T-bond rate today, but it could be different tomorrow, right? And after you've made this list, here's something I, I find cathartic, but actually is very healthy in valuation. I want you to put it into buckets. See, what are you talking about? I want you to first classify that uncertainty into estimation uncertainty and economic uncertainty. I'll draw the contrast. Economic Estimation uncertainty is uncertainty because you haven't done enough of your homework. So if you're valuing Tesla and you don't know how many electric cars were sold in 2022, you can fix that, right? You can go collect the data, fix it. That's estimation uncertainty. More work, more data will solve that. Economic uncertainty, though no amount of research is going to make come up with an answer. So if I ask you what percentage of cars in 2032 are going to be electric, you can go through Google search. In fact, the more you look, the more, un the more uncertain you're going to get. Because this is about 10 years from now, you're making a judgment and no amount of... What I'm trying to tell you is when it's economic uncertainty, working more, collecting more data, doing more research is not going to make that uncertainty go away. And here's the bad news. 90% of the uncertainty you face when valuing most companies is economic uncertainty. There's a point, I call this the, the karmic point, where you have to say, look, I've done everything I can. There's a point I would reach to. If you have a company, you don't know, Twitter, who knows who's going to be running the company, whether it's model. You say, I've done my best, but going out and collecting more data is not going to make my valuation better. I know we're almost running out of time, but let me hit the other two groups. Your uncertainty can be micro uncertainty or macro uncertainty. And I value te Tesla. Which uncertainty do you think is greater? What's micro uncertainty? It's uncertainty about the company, its management. It's, it's a lot of micro uncertainty at Tesla, right? There's some macro uncertainty as well. as now How many people switch to electric cars? What are the regulations going to look like? In contrast, when you value Adani, there's a lot of macro uncertainty in this process. How quickly will India grow? How much will infrastructure investment look like? You're saying, who cares? Macro uncertainty shows up in your discount rate. Micro uncertainty does not. Next session, we'll talk about why micro uncertainties. So you can feel very uncertain about who will follow Elon Musk, but that doesn't translate into a higher discount rate. And finally, you can have discrete uncertainty or continuous uncertainty. What's continuous uncertainty? It's uncertainty you face every moment of every day, right? If you're a US company, the European operations, every time the dollar euro exchange rate changes, your cash flows are effectively changing. Discrete uncertainty is uncertainty that doesn't happen, doesn't, that when it does happen, it could be potentially catastrophic. In the case of the Adani group, the discrete uncertainty you're worried about is, hey, what if there's default? In some companies, it might be nationalization risk. Risk that if they happen, they don't happen very often, thank God, but when they do, can change the entire landscape. So I'm going to leave you with that because on Wednesday, we're going to talk about how you bring risk into your valuation. It's going to be determined not by what you think about a company, but what marginal investors in the company think about the company. Sounds counterintuitive, but I'll start with that because that's going to give us the basis for every risk and return model.